denote the international criminal class, class who deploy crime and violence and who cultivate forms of extreme masculinity to achieve their ends. While I do not believe that capitalism or war will ever replace Das Kapital, I value it as yet another example of the insurgents of the Frontera Norte, the insistence that its citizens must develop theories that take into account the violence of the narco state. Valencia, argue, Valencia argues that gore capitalism is a product that requires extreme masculinity and that it has now captured governments and the media. It is not the archaic elements of narco, uh, narco culture that authors like Herrera emphasize, but rather the question, ¿Por qué necesitamos carne, sangre y desmembramiento para que la realidad vuelve a ser verdad? She argues that capitalism gore is S. Elris, by which, of course, she means narco uh, executions and narco atrocities. Uh, S. El Resulta, uh, but also she sort of emphasizes this is a form of capitalism. Uh, es el resultado de la interpretación y la participación activa, violenta e irreversible de los enriagos del mundo globalizado, del hiperconsumismo y de las fronteras, plus valor y carnicería. Los enriagos son los nuevos sujetos del capitalismo core. Andriago comes from the novels of chivalry, from Amadis de Gaula, and refers to monsters. <laughs> but she brings it into being as, as a, a, a term for the Andriago, for the narco. What produces the Andriago is the juxtaposition of unlimited consumption and extreme poverty. The Andriago subject, often recruited from the underclass, makes violence a way of life and of work, and socialization and culture, um, and also of socialization and culture, while the dramatization of violence in the cinema and television gives them cachet. The exploits of the executioners are all available on the web, and cruelty has reached new extremes in beheadings, quartering, in the immersion of living people in acid, making the body a gruesome messenger of the new order. How am I getting on? I mean, okay? Mm -hmm. In the chapter headed Fronteras como Zonas Nacionales de Sacrificio, she argues that the criminal networks and drug cartels on the northern border of Mexico constitute a post-colonialism in extremis that brings together the logic of consumption with frustration, making explicit violence and radical action and radical forms of self-affirmation. Tijuana, designated by Garcia Canclini as one of the great laboratories of post-modernity, becomes for Sayac Valencia an ultra form of capitalism or gore that penetrates every aspect of daily life. Thus, for, him, for instance, the seemingly harmless for sale sign on a house in what she sarcastically terms la gran ciudad postmoderna could mean that the owner had been kidnapped and it was being sold for ransom money. In this economy, the body is negotiable and death is desacralized. Before the NAFTA Accord was signed in 1994, President Miguel de la Madrid created a border program that was intended to, pu to publicize the fact that the border population was within the nation. Deborah Castillo suggests that the border culture program of de la Madrid projected a Me Mexico both educated and united in order to counteract national anxieties about appropriation or absorption by the United States as a result of the NAFTA Accord. It has also been suggested that his aim was to cultivar y nacionalizar a los estados fronterizos, dándose de conocer lo que consideró la esencia de lo mexicano. The authors I've described are engaged in precise, precisely 
in, re in refuting any notion of a homogeneous national culture by focusing on the absurdity of speaking of licencia de lo mexicano. Given that not only individuals but also the nation itself is biseccionado between a capital that often views the North Bolaño fashion primarily, primarily as a no man's land and a frontier that is more of a lure than a deterrent. And that's it, I'm sorry. That's all I have. <laughs> so much. Do you want to feel your, we, we have time for questions and for discussion. I'm so sure you'll be feel all free. ready to attack me with your <laughs> bows and arrows or whatever. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I have an initial question yeah. about, uh, about this uh, transfer to, how you see this transfer to the north of uh, <coughs> The, set, the, the kind of epicenter of um, literary production and the like. Uh, do you th uh, and its connection to your work before on lettered city and the like. Yeah. I mean, clearly these aren't lettered cities, but uh, um, how do you see print and writing uh, uh, and even discussion yeah. circulating in a context like the one that you described for Torreón or for? Right. Uh, uh, that's the most extraordinary thing about it. I think it's just the, the very fact of, of, of having to try and live in those places that seems to sort of provide an incentive for people to try and represent it in some way or other, right? And um, certainly I find the co contemporary North literature of the North far more interesting, far more experimental, far more daring than anything that's being produced in Mexico City at the moment. And I think, you know, they can only just comment on it in Mexico City and let us leave it or something like that. But, you know, there's not the same engagement with a, with a, a situation which is an extreme situation. It calls for something, right? And it can't, call, it doesn't call somehow for political action because you, what political action can you develop in some of these environments like Torreon, right? Um, so it, the, the response has been somewhat, you know, literary in various ways, which was, I tried to show different sort of attempts. Come on, you literary critics, give me a bashing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm an anthropologist, not a literary critic. Oh, okay. I'll, uh, I'll be forgiven. Don't apologize. <laughs> No, but I was very interesting, interested in much of what you were saying, but, it, but particularly your discussion about the, the, the creation, the recreation of the feudal. The recreation of what? Of the feudal. Oh, of the feudal, the, yeah, right. Yeah. And as you were reading a corrido in that tradition, my mind flashed back to the reenactments that you find throughout Mexico of the Moros y Cristianos. And I was wondering if you thought about that or if, I'm, if I was just being swept away in my own fantasy. <laughs> No, I, th I mean, it's interesting that those, uh, there are those traditions, right? But I, I think this is something, uh, I mean, that's provoked by the present situation. No, I understand. Yeah. That. I understand that. But, but, the, but these were... Through literature departments at universities, so they probably do know about it. But they're also on the streets. I and mean, they're all, yes. Yeah. yeah. But no, the corrido, obviously, that's not... No. Yeah, course. that's not indebted to, to, a, to the literary people, but I think that's an interesting point, uh, that you've got, I mean, well, of course, the Corrido, in a way, as a ballad form, I mean, it does, uh, you know, it's got a huge, long, a hugely long tradition, if of course. you go back to the ballad, right? Uh, so it's not surprising that some of the, um, uh, some of the attributes of the Corrido are those of a ballad tradition, a very ancient ballad tradition. Um, but, I mean, uh, one very interesting thing is the importance of the narco corrido, right? I mean, it's, uh, uh, I mean, it's a form which is, uh, uh, published, it was like those Tigres del Norte that, uh, that um, uh, put it out in all kinds of discs. It's on the radio, it's on the old time, it's on television. It's a very popular form, the narco cor corrido, and it, it's uh, really kind of um, mostly, all I have, most of the ones I've seen, are really 
praise poems to the narco. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. yeah. You're going to have to speak up because I'm slightly deaf. Yeah. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask you if you would consider also new devotions as part of this cultural uh, panorama. I mean, you, you, you speak about corridos or, or, or literature. I was thinking about, for instance, the Malverde devotion in the north oh, of right. Mexico. Okay. So, yeah, if you would. Uh, <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, like if you can go into sort of popular religion, there's Malverde and, and there's uh, La Santa Muerte, right? The, La Santa Muerte and Malverde are really both saints of the uh, narco. Malverde was a, uh, an outlaw and he was uh, uh, fusilado, right, at the end of his life. And it was like, obviously, he was fusilado at the end of his life, right? <laughs> but anyway. He was fusilado, uh, so he's one of the the uh, heroes, right now, of the narco. As is Santa Muerte. I, in, in my in my book, I have a, a quotation from um, Sergio Gonzalez. Uh, it comes from Sergio Gonzalez, who interviewed a man who had beheaded beheaded people, and he described it in quite matter-of-fact terms, what it was like to do the beheading, what happened afterwards, and how the next they did, what they did was to go to the sanctuary where it was La Santa Muerte, and so they sort of prayed to La Santa Muerte. Uh, it's something I find very difficult to understand. I mean, such a negative kind of, uh, of worship. I mean, you know, there's no uh, alleluia in this at all, right? <laughs> Just the opposite. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Hi. Uh, thanks so much for the talk. I have a couple of questions. Yeah. One would be um, if, um, about the Antonio Antonio's recent novel, La Fila India, which is a novel about uh, you know, uh, Central American migrants. Uh, Sorry, India. which one? Uh, La Fila India. Oh, La Fila India. I've not read it yet. Uh, no, 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 I got sorry. it on my desk. Okay. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> question aside. But I think it's an interesting novel yeah. to, to see how, you know, New, uh, new, new themes and new ways of exploring precisely like journalistic and realist fiction yeah. relays that may not be as experimental or experimental in a literary uh, way as in say novels like Jure Reda, but I think it's yeah. just a new, new trend. But then my other question would be, what do you make of uh, recent uh, Mexican films like Eli by uh, Amat Escalante or uh -huh. uh, say La Jaula de Oro by Diego Quemada Diez, which I think I, they're very much also uh, reinvigorating and showing new ways of, of understanding cinema yes. through the context of narco war and how does, how does this cinema is informed by narco literature and how narco literature is also uh, in a way uh, yeah. working out these uh, movies or, or, or in dialogue with these movies. I wish I had an answer. I mean, I would like, <laughs> It's obviously a dissertation topic, right? <laughs> because I mean, but I'd love to. I'll, I'll have to think about it. I haven't really got an answer to it because I'm not actually. I've not been able to. This is a fairly new thing for me, and so I've not actually been able to sort of look at the film side of it, the cinematic side of it. And there's a lot to look at there, so I, ha I haven't done that yet. I'm yeah. sorry. Or even photography, like Fernando. Photography, Lee, yeah, yeah. I think like it's very like multimedia. Like that. Yeah, yeah. And I never, I'm, I have a, oh, a terrible failing. I never ever look at the so-called red. So you know, I'm missing a lot, obviously. <laughs> yes. Um, I wonder, for you um, that have external eyes, um, if um, this is more about the culture. If you have thought that actually all these expressions of, of violence have to do more uh, with the um, with inner characteristic of Mexican culture and probably Latin American culture uh, that is like we are a violent culture and we have always been a violent culture rather than an expression of modernism um, um, as, as some have uh, um, claimed. That's a really difficult question. I'm very reluctant to sort of think that Latin Americans are more violent than anybody else. I think the English can be violent. 
I think the Americans certainly can be violent. I mean, I don't, you won't have to sort of look what happens in the, you know, 